Thank you and uh, good afternoon. Let me thank again uh, the organizers for putting together this uh, great workshop and also the school that we had last week. It's been fun uh, having a couple of lectures, especially one on a Saturday morning uh, that I will, never, I will never forget. Uh, so during this seminar, I will show you some uh, applications of the ideas we've seen last week. For those of you who didn't follow the, the lectures, I'm still going to put some uh, uh, introduction, even though for sure it's not going to be uh, very uh, thorough. So uh, the, today's topic is about using machine learning techniques. So if you want uh, uh, artificial intelligence to study quantum many body uh, problems. Uh, the, the, the problems I'm going to discuss today and uh, the, the, the works I'm going to discuss today have been realized uh, so first uh, in collaboration with uh, Matthias Troyer, who's now at Microsoft Research in Seattle. Uh, so this paper here, and then uh, uh, another work also uh, pretty recent in collaboration with Roger Merkel's group at Perimeter and uh, University of Waterloo, Juan Carrasquilla at D-Wave, and uh, Guglielmo Mazzola at ETH uh, Zurich. So, uh, first of all, what is the problem we would like to solve and address with uh, neural networks and uh, uh, how, what can we do about that? So, uh, the, probably one of the most central problems in, uh, in quantum physics, uh, or in theoretical physics in general, is uh, the, the quantum many-body problem. So, uh, this problem is uh, easily stated. We've seen uh, also already some uh, instances of this problem uh, already during this talk, this, this um, conference. And the idea is that imagine that you have a Hamiltonian uh, which uh, uh, has a, a large number of microscopic degrees of freedom. For example, you can have electrons, neutral atoms, spins, uh, whatever you prefer. Uh, and uh, these, uh, these microscopic degrees of freedom are strongly interacting. For example, you can have a Coulomb interactions or uh, whatever your favorite interaction is. So the quantum anybody problem, uh, for example, one of, of its manifestations is the fact that it is very hard, typically, both numerically and analytically, to solve for the ground state of this, uh, this Hamiltonian, and also to study the, uh, the quantum dynamics, for example, if you want to solve the time dependence sharing equation. So why, why is it the case? Well, if you uh, turn to a classical computer and you want to solve this uh, uh, complicated equation, you want to find ground state, for example, so the minimal thing that you have to do is to, uh, let's say, fix a set of complete set of many body states, uh, and you have to represent, if you want, on your computer store the, the amplitudes of the wave function, at least, if you want to find it. So uh, the point is that if you do a calculation, for example, if we take a, sp a, c a spin system, which, which has uh, n degrees of freedom, so the quantum numbers can be, uh, go from one to n, and they can be either plus or minus one in this case, and you store, again, the amplitudes on your, on your classical computer, then we realize that uh, uh, even if we use all the atoms available on our planet, uh, we could uh, at most simulate, uh, let's say, 100 spins. So this problem uh, is uh, very hard, so really finding the ground state, for example, is extremely hard for a classical computer because uh, the, the amount of, uh, of uh, resources that we need uh, grow exponentially with the, with the system size, simply because the, the Hilbert space is two to the n, so you, you need an exponentially large number of, of amplitudes. Now, we don't want to, uh, to turn ourselves into a giant hard disk, and we want to solve this problem more efficiently. There are techniques, for example, that uh, uh, exploit other concepts. For example, quantum Monte Carlo techniques do not store, if you want, the coefficients of the wave function uh, exactly, the, the exponentially many coefficients of the wave function, but sample efficiently from, those, uh, from the wave function using a mapping onto an equivalent classical system. So typically, this is realized through the path integral mapping. Another philosophy that allows you to, uh, to, sum, to, to solve efficiently for, for a large class of, uh, of quantum Hamiltonians is what has been discussed uh, by Norbert Schuch in, uh, in, in his lectures and are, for example, magic quarter states. So again, the idea here is that you can write an efficient answers for the many-body ground state, for the many-body state, which, in, uh, which has only, only typically a very a relatively low number of variational parameters. And if your system is uh, has a, a low entanglement, so in, par in particular if it satisfies the area law, then you can demonstrate that you can describe uh, efficiently all uh, those, uh, those states. Uh, 
But uh, both families have, uh, of methods, which are very popular and are very powerful, uh, have uh, several uh, limitations which in practice uh, uh, somehow limit a lot our ability to explore a lot of interesting problems in, uh, in many body physics in, in uh, diverse domains going from condensed matter to uh, ultra gold atoms. So, for example, if you take quantum Monte Carlo methods, they break, so this mapping that I described before, breaks for fermions or frustrated spin models. Uh, so there is no way, for example, also to access real-time dynamics in an efficient way. So this means that these techniques uh, suffer from uh, this, this uh, infamous same problem, which basically uh, uh, does not allow you to study very important problems, and most notably fermions and out of equilibrium dynamics. On the other hand, uh, uh, medic product states, so tensor networks in general, uh, are very efficient, they're extremely powerful at studying uh, uh, one-dimensional lattice geometries. When you try to apply them, when you apply them to other uh, systems, uh, for example, in continuous space or in two dimensions, there are uh, some difficulties that emerge numerically and uh, also the, uh, the efficiency of these, of these approaches is uh, uh, much reduced with respect to one-dimensional case. So it's clear that uh, it would be desirable to have uh, some new approach, so some alternative technique, which would allow us somehow to take the best of these two worlds. So on one hand, the, the ability of quantum Monte Carlo to, to sample efficiently from uh, the ground state or from the quantum state, many body state. And on the other hand, the ability of medics for the states, tensor networks, to somehow compress the wave function using some, uh, some regularity property of the, of the many body state. So how can we do that? Well, during this talk, I will try to convince you that uh, a good way of doing that, of doing so, is by introducing a representation of the state which is based on artificial neural networks, uh, on machine learning ideas, if you want. And then I'm going to show you how we can use this representation uh, efficiently to find, for example, the ground state of some interesting uh, quantum problems, to study the unitary dynamics, uh, and then towards the end, I will also discuss an application of this representation to uh, the problem of uh, quantum state tomography. So I'm going to discuss this towards the end. Now, so, uh, so all of this, uh, as I was mentioning, is based on, on machine learning. Uh, I've discussed these things uh, last week, but uh, just to, to, to recall uh, a little bit what, what the, 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 the fundamental stuff in this field uh, is, uh, um, is, is important to recall, first of all, that to do machine learning, we need, first of all, a machine. And typically, one of the machines that people have started considering and using in, uh, in, uh, in applications is a highly idealized version of the, of the brain, of the human brain, or of uh, even the animal brain. So in this idealized, highly idealized version of the brain, we imagine that our brain is nothing but a high-dimensional function. So something which takes a, a high-dimensional input vector, x1, x2, x5 in this case, and which outputs, so this input signal, if you want, uh, into another output vector, which for, in this case is f1, f2. So I have a high-dimensional function uh, which will depend on a lot of nonlinear uh, synapses, so a lot of connection uh, which uh, will transform this input signal into an output signal. And in practice, so mathematically, I just, uh, to all purposes, I can assume that I'm working, uh, in this case, with, uh, with an artificial neural network, which is a function, a high-dimensional function of this input vector, depending on some uh, parameters W, which are somehow the parameters that I want to find to do my, my, my things. So, of course, this, uh, this version of the brain is uh, really idealized, and uh, from the mathematical point of view, from the biological point of view, it's also very bad, in the sense that it's somehow approximating the sphere, the, the cow with the sphere, and then going on, right? So it's, it's like those approximations that physicists or mathematicians like to do, but it's not very accurate. But to, to any purpose, we can use this idea of having a high-dimensional function which mimics the brain functionality. And what we can do is, is that then we can use this machine to do the learning. So the learning means that uh, we, we fix a task, and I'm going to show you some specific tasks in a, in a moment. And then I want to, to, to find basically those weights, I want to find the structure of the network that best does this task, so that best realizes this task. And this is achieved for, uh, typically using a, a sort of big data approach where I can generate or I can retrieve a large amount of, amount of data. And from those, I can learn how to do this specific task that I'm interested in. So this is the basic philosophy of machine learning. 
Now, uh, of course, I mean, you know uh, about the tasks that uh, machine learning can do. Uh, for example, in the case of uh, language translations, so in the, uh, Google, uh, uh, Google Translate is based actually on machine learning. So in that case, my artificial neural network, again, is a high dimensional function, which take as an input a string, so a high dimensional input, which is a string, and outputs another high dimensional input, which is the translation in, uh, in English or in any other language you want. And these, uh, these things, uh, basically, uh, so the structure of the network, the, the, the weights in this network are obtained, for example, looking and, uh, uh, through a lot of pre-translated texts. So the same thing, for example, happens for uh, optical recognition of characters. So you have uh, a digit which is written uh, on, uh, on a sheet of paper. You have a lot of them. And you can train your network to recognize uh, one of those digits and uh, tr uh, translate it into an actual number. You can have speech recognition, uh, autonomous driving, and so on and so forth. So this, those are the cut, most cutting edge and important applications of uh, neural networks. So uh, how can we use those, and how can we use machine learning to, 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 to do quantum mechanics? So uh, basically, uh, the idea uh, that we introduce is that we can represent the, uh, the many-body state as a, an artificial neural network. So this is a high-dimensional function, this is a brain highly specialized brain that I was discussing at the beginning. So we can see it as an object whose task is to compute the amplitudes of the wave function. So for example, I give, you, I give to the brain, this artificial brain, a set of quantum numbers, and then the task of this thing will be to compute the amplitudes of the wave function. Then uh, what uh, we, we show that it's possible to do is that we can train those networks to, to find, for example, the ground state to represent the general many-body quantum states, and also to find uh, the dynamics. So I'm going to, to tell you a little bit more about that in a second. But uh, first of all, uh, in order to be more precise, we need to specify at least what is the structure of the network that we are going to use to represent these uh, uh, quantum states. And uh, in our paper, uh, what we did is that we used one of the, let's say, uh, most straightforward networks uh, uh, if you come from a background of, uh, of physics, which is called the restricted Boltzmann machine. So in this network, you can imagine that uh, uh, your input variables, so your uh, visible layer, as it's called in, ger in the jargon, uh, is connected to a, a lot of hidden uh, uh, spins. So these are effectively hidden spins through a set of interactions, uh, effective interactions, which has to, has, has to be determined in order to represent uh, the, the quantum state. So an important feature of these of this states is that upon increasing the number of hidden spins, so we can think about these hidden spins as somehow um, uh, the, the, the neurons that you have in your brain, so your gray matter. So the more you have of those, the smarter, in a sense, the wave function can be. And you can hope that increasing this number, I mean, actually, it's not a hope. It's based on, on some theorems. You can represent basically any generic high dimensional function and including uh, uh, quantum wave functions. So in practice, from a mathematical point of view, this, uh, this means that we, we, we write the amplitudes in this form uh, as uh, uh, basically the partition function of a system which contains, uh, so as you can see, interactions between the spin variables, this sigma, so these hidden variables, which are themselves spins. Uh, and then uh, uh, those interactions are parameterized by some weight interaction matrix Wij, which basically is uh, is the, the most important part of my variational parameters. So uh, I can interpret the weights of these neural networks as variational parameters for my, uh, for my quantum problem. Then what I can do, again, as I was mentioning, is that I can increase or I can adjust this parameter alpha, so basically the number of hidden variables over the number of physical variables in order to uh, achieve the accuracy uh, that, I, that, I, that I'm looking for on some given problem. So, uh, for example, how can I find the ground state? Well, uh, the basic idea uh, that I detailed uh, during uh, last week's lecture is that uh, uh, what you can do is that you can sample, so you can generate a lot of data from those variational wave functions, so like you do in, uh, in Monte Carlo. So in particular, this is like variational Monte Carlo. And then obtaining some feedback from the variational principle, you can change the network parameters until you converge to the, to the variational ground state. So in particular, I've shown you that uh, uh, already that uh, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, which is the quantity you want to minimize if you want to find the ground state of your problem, can be obtained, uh, can be estimated stochastically, generating a lot of samples 
which are distributing according to the amplitude squared of my wave function, okay? So this is free from same problem in the sense that the quantity that I'm trying to sample from is by definition positive. And you can show that it, uh, it is possible to obtain uh, uh, stochastic averages, not only of the energy, but also of the gradient. So uh, this is uh, detailed in the, in the lecture notes uh, that uh, I discussed last week. So in particular on this GitLab uh, repository, you can find uh, the lecture notes I was discussing and also some de detailed derivations of those estimators, including the codes that we were um, uh, showing last week. So uh, this is just to mention again that uh, also the energy gradient, so the energy, the, the gradient of the expectation value can be efficiently written as a, a, a statistical expectation value over this probability distribution, but the details are in there. Now, um, once we have the gradient, so we have, we have a way to compute uh, uh, rather efficiently both the, the, the expectation value of the energy and uh, the gradient of the energy with respect to the variational parameters, which in this case are just the network connections. So how can we uh, proceed? So how can uh, we optimize this quantity? Well, uh, the, the approach that we use in this case is to use an approach which is due, uh, well, that in the variational Monte Carlo community is known as a stochastic reconfiguration method, which has been devised uh, here in Trieste by Sandro Sorella and uh, uh, co-workers. So the basic idea is to, to have an approximation of the, of, uh, of the, of the matrix of, uh, of the system, which is spanned by those variational uh, vectors. So O of k is uh, given by the, the log derivative of the, of the wave function. And uh, uh, one can also show that this thing is uh, somehow dual and it's completely equivalent to an imaginary time evolution. So what you can do, so this approach is basically equivalent to taking your Hamiltonian and doing the variational uh, uh, evolution in the variational subspace to find the ground state of your uh, quantum Hamiltonian in the variational subspace. The, the interesting thing that I find out when working on this is that this approach was developed, uh, but in a very different language in the, in the machine learning community, like uh, more or less uh, uh, 10 years earlier, by Amari. Uh, so you can see that here we have the Journal of Chemical Physics, here we have the Journal of Neural Computation, so completely orthogonal fields. But this, the, more or less the very same method had been developed uh, in, the, in the, this other community, and uh, nobody knew about each other until basically last year. So um, now I can show you at work how this thing works. Uh, for example, uh, uh, what I'm showing you here is the, 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 the value of the energy, so the expectation value of the energy as a function of this iteration. So this, uh, this optimization algorithm is an iterative algorithm which converges uh, iteratively uh, to the ground state. Uh, and uh, for example, this is the case of the, of the Eisenberg model. Um, so the one-dimensional Eisenberg model uh, in, uh, so on, uh, on a chain, antiferromagnetic Eisenberg model. And here you can see that uh, uh, the energy, first of all, converges uh, when you increase the number of iterations to a minimum. And uh, this minimum uh, uh, coincides, in this case, uh, very nicely with the exact one. So this is a system I believe, of uh, about 80 or 100 uh, spins. Uh, and uh, the, the important thing is that you can see uh, already here is that, uh, well, at, from, this, uh, from this zoom of the final part, is that when you increase alpha, so when you increase the number of hidden neurons over the hidden over the actual physical uh, um, spins, so when you uh, somehow increase the gray matter in your brain, uh, the accuracy systematically improves. So, for example, this is alpha equal two, this is alpha equal four. So you can see that you can systematically approach the exact ground state, and you can see also that the, the accuracy that one can reach are pretty high. So from these uh, numbers here. We can, we, we can quantify a little bit better those accuracy, plotting the relative error on the, on the energy on a few ground states for some models. For example, the one d transverse field dicing model, you can see we can reach with alpha equal four, some 10 to the minus, minus five precision. And you can also see something which is pretty interesting that uh, if you take the 1D transverse field dicing model and you go at the critical point, so which is H equal one, so the transverse field equal to one, this is also the worst uh, uh, point for the, for, the, for the neural network uh, because it's, it's at the critical point so somehow it's harder to learn for this machine. But still you can see that using a relatively mo modest value of alpha we can manage to find uh, very high uh, accuracy. Then uh, we can, uh, we can uh, use the same approach to study, for example, again, the 1D Eisenberg model, uh, where we can go to, again, to high precision. Uh, and uh, we improve, for example, some existing uh, other variational Monte Carlo techniques, like the Jastrow uh, uh, wave function, which is an ansatz for the many-body state. Uh, 
uh, in 2D, we also managed to, uh, to find uh, um, uh, an improvement over some uh, existing uh, at the time results. For example, these entangled plug plugged states, which are also a variational state used uh, with uh, variational Monte Carlo. Uh, some uh, uh, existing PEPS states, probably this number has been improved a little bit uh, since uh, uh, this, uh, this original work. Uh, but also in, in this case, in two dimensions, we see that increasing alpha, we managed to, uh, even though with a slower convergence, but we managed to, to find uh, uh, the ground state with relatively high precision. So another important thing which is worth mentioning is that uh, uh, this representation of the ground state so here, I think it's uh, 10 by 10 in this case. Uh, we, we can do more. So uh, the, the important thing that, uh, one of the interesting things that I wanted to mention here is that uh, uh, this representation, since it is highly nonlinear, so it's, uh, if you want, a nonlinear decomposition of the wave function coefficients, uh, it has to be contrasted, for example, with the linear decomposition that one does in the context of, uh, of uh, tensor networks. So since this is nonlinear, in principle, can be more, let's say, compact. And uh, what we found is basically, for example, on those 1D uh, problems for the Eisenberg, for example, uh, to, to reach the same accuracy, we need uh, more or less uh, even uh, 10 to the 2, like 100 times less parameters than uh, the corresponding uh, matrix product states. So this points to the fact that somehow these networks are, uh, in a sense, uh, more compact representations of those uh, um, states. Now, uh, if you look uh, at the, those weights, so these, those effective interactions that appear in, um, in the classical equivalent model, of course, uh, uh, not always they, they, give, they tell you something uh, uh, physically relevant. So these are, for example, uh, uh, some extract of the, of, the, of the connections. So you have to think that this is a, a matrix which where you, for, for, for each side, you have an interaction with the other side. Uh, so those basically are uh, the, the effective interactions that you have in the neural network. So uh, in the case of, for example, the Eisenberg 1D, you see that those interactions are pretty long-ranged, so you don't see any local structure. For the 1D, Ising, instead we see some kind of local structure, even at the critical point. For the 2D Eisenberg model, we see, again, some uh, locality in uh, this co those coefficients. However, uh, in, in general, uh, we don't have yet a recipe like to understand from those numbers what the, the, the features of the system are. But I'm going to tell you more about this in a second. Now, uh, how, can we solve, uh, how can we use this approach also to solve for, uh, for unitary dynamics, for example? So we've seen uh, uh, at the beginning that uh, the, the two big open problems are, for example, say, finding the ground state of interacting fermions, say, the Hubble model, most notably, in two dimensions. Uh, or in continuous space, some, some models. Um, but also the, the, also the very important open issue is how to solve for unitary dynamics and find, for example, out of equilibrium properties of interacting, uh, of interacting models. So we can do that too. Uh, and the idea is to use uh, an approach that uh, uh, we developed here during uh, my PhD in Trieste. Um, described in this paper. So the, the main idea of this approach, which is uh, uh, very similar to the time-dependent variational principle uh, used in the context of, uh, of the matrix product states, and we came out more or less at the same time. So the idea is that uh, basically imagine that you have an Hilbert space, which in this case is two-dimensional, so just to simplify the, um, the notation and the, the, the plot, actually. So you have a, a, a given state at time t, which is this green line, psi of t. Then you know that uh, at time t plus delta t, your, uh, time, your state uh, will evolve according to uh, this uh, infinitesimal evolution induced by the, the Hamiltonian, right? So you, can, you know that this is basically just a rotation in Hilbert space. But on the other hand, you know that you can parameterize the, the rotation, if you want, of your state, of your variational state, through basically the variational derivatives, so those OK objects, which are nothing but, if you want, directions in Hilbert space that span this, uh, this rotation. So that's why also your rotation is restricted. Then uh, what, what, we, what, what, what one can do is that one can uh, minimize basically this angle, if you want, this distance between this approximate and this, uh, uh, this, approximate and this exact state. And when you do so, you find an equation of motion for the variational parameters. So I'm sorry for the confusion, but alpha now is the, alpha of k is the, the set of variational parameters, so it's not the, what I defined before. But anyway, so imagine that you have your variational parameters that I call here alpha of k, 
uh, then uh, we showed, I mean, that you can, uh, what you need to do is that at each time step, uh, you can uh, uh, solve this, uh, this uh, linear system, basically, which allows you to solve the optimal equation of motion, so define, if you want, the optimal alpha dot, so the time derivative of the, the variational parameters, which allow you to, to best uh, reproduce the unit dynamics. So, and again, this can be done using uh, uh, Monte Carlo, so you can sample from psi square, uh, and uh, all of that is relatively straightforward to implement. Now, uh, we use this approach in conjunction with uh, those neural network quantum states, uh, for example, in 1D. Uh, so here you can see uh, that we started some uh, quantum quenches. So in this case, we prepared, for example, the system in the ground state of my 1D uh, transfer field dating model, say for one initial value of the transfer field, four or one half in this case. Uh, and then we quench at time equals zero, so we change uh, uh, very rapidly the, the value of the, of, the, of, the, of the transfer speed and observe the behavior of sigma x as a function of time, for example. So again, this is, this, those are results obtained at alpha equal four, so a fixed number of, uh, um, of uh, hidden units. And you can see that we can manage to, we manage to reproduce also pretty nicely the, the, the exact dynamics which can be computed in this case because it's an integrable model. Uh, but also for non-integrable models, uh, well, at least for the Eisenberg model, even though it's integrable, we don't know how to compute, uh, I think, the, the exact evolution of some quantities. And still we managed to match some uh, results obtained with, uh, with, um, um, with MPS, so time-dependent uh, uh, matrix product states. Now, um, so this was about uh, the, the problem of, uh, let's say, trying to solve for the ground state or for the dynamics. But once we have, a, a, let's say, a compact and alternative representation of the, one, of the ground state or of a, of a general quantum state, we can use it also for other purposes. So one of the purposes that we, we introduced, that we wanted to use this, uh, this approach for, is uh, the problem of quantum state uh, tomography. So the basic idea, the basic problem in this case, is that, uh, for example, imagine that you have a pure state. So you have a quantum system which is described by a pure state, psi. Uh, and then you can have access uh, to some measurements in, uh, in those, uh, on those systems. So it's a spin system, you can measure the spin in some basis, for example. Then the problem is that you would like to reconstruct the state of this quantum system just from those uh, measurements that you can do in the lab. So uh, standard approaches like uh, full quantum state tomography uh, require, uh, for example, basically an amount of measurement which scales exponentially with the system size simply because you have to reconstruct all the exponentially many coefficients in, uh, in the, your wave function. So, uh, so these are relatively ineffective because you cannot, uh, for example, reconstruct more than uh, eight or uh, eight is also uh, already a very large uh, number of, of uh, spins of qubits that you can reconstruct with standard approaches. So the idea that we use instead is to do the so-called unsupervised learning. So the idea here is that we do not want to determine uh, uh, the variational ground state because we don't know the Hamiltonian, and we don't know uh, some uh, exact properties of the system, but we can measure from, we can sample from the wave function using some measurements. So what we can do is basically we can uh, uh, do the measurements in the lab in some given basis. For example, we can measure in the sigma z basis, sigma x on some other alternative basis. Uh, and then uh, using only basically the, this information, reconstructing the, 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 the square models of the wave function in those bases using uh, uh, machine learning techniques, we are able to, uh, to reconstruct both the phase and uh, the, the amplitude of the, of the wave function. So in particular, we have found, uh, we have demonstrated this approach for the, that is first for a simple W state, which is the state that has been mentioned also uh, in other cases. So just for reference, here if you do full tomography, uh, it, needs, it takes about one million measurements to reconstruct the wave function of eight spins. With machine learning techniques, we can uh, substantially reduce this number. For example, we can do 80 spins, so 80 qubits with uh, 10 to the three, 10 to the four measurements. So it's substantial improvement over, uh, let's say, uh, brute force uh, tomography. And this is the overlap with the, with, the, with the target state that I'm plotting here as a number of samples. Uh, another thing that we can do is that we can reconstruct, uh, again, uh, also the, the, the phases of, of the wave function. This is an example for the W state with random phases. Here we manage uh, to reconstruct, uh, so these, those are the exact phases for some uh, relatively small system. Those are the RBM reconstructed phases. Also, we managed to get a pretty good uh, reconstruction. Uh, one of the applications, which I believe is also particularly interesting, is to reconstruct uh, uh, some uh, uh, quantum systems. 
from which you can measure in the experiment some quantities, but not some other quantities. So let me mention the case of the, uh, so okay, so we did, we did the unit dynamics. So, uh, we can discuss this later if you want. But this is the, one of the most interesting applications that I believe uh, could be realized, especially with cold atoms. So the idea is that, uh, uh, for example, for a system of bosons, just using uh, in situ images of the densities, we, and uh, not a lot of measurements of those, uh, those densities, we can reconstruct the many body wave function of possibly a rather large system. And then, uh, so in silico on the computer, so using this reconstructed wave function, we can measure, uh, so let's say in a post-processing phase, quantities which are not directly accessible in the experiment. For example, the, the entanglement entropy. So the entanglement entropy is very hard to measure in an experiment of cold atoms. So we can do that indirectly. Now, let, you, let me just flash um, the, some, um, very quickly, uh, some properties of those neural network quantum states. So this representation of the many body state in terms of uh, artificial neural networks, which people have started studying after our work. For example, it has been shown already that uh, they allow for an exact description of uh, many interesting topological phases. Uh, for example, they allow to describe uh, uh, 1D symmetry protected state or the toric code in two dimensions with a number of neurons which is very relatively, is a polynomially large. But they also allow to describe efficiently a class of states like uh, chiral P wave states, uh, which are instead not necessarily very efficiently describable by other um, approaches. Uh, another important uh, thing which has been shown uh, in this paper is that this, this theorem, so basically if you have your weights in the wave function, then and you call R the range of the weights in your wave function, you can show that the entanglement entropy is basically bounded by the distance. So basically the correlation between uh, somehow the support of those weights interactions, that effective interactions that you have in, the, in, the, in this matrix. So this means that in practice it is very easy and efficient to satisfy the volume law in those, uh, with those states, uh, which also has the, somehow suggests that we could use those kind of approaches to study efficiently uh, critical states in, uh, in one or two days. Uh, another thing is that there is also a connection with uh, modest product state and answer networks. Uh, at least, it, uh, well, it's relatively straightforward to show that uh, a general uh, uh, um, MPS state uh, corresponds to an MPS with an exponentially large bond dimension, uh, where this exponentially large part comes from the fact that you might have uh, long range entanglement and long range uh, uh, weight W. So it comes, if you want, from the previous theorem. Uh, the inverse mapping is more subtle, uh, so I mean, there are people that conjecture that in 1D those states might be more or less completely equivalent to uh, MPS, but this is only at the level of conjecture and we don't have a proof. So the mathematical reason is that proving this for nonlinear states is very hard. So uh, the other thing which I believe is also particularly interesting is that uh, there are strong representability theorems for Boltzmann machines. So if we take an, a network which, costed, uh, which is done of two layers, so not like the one with only one layer that I showed you before, but with another further layer, then you can show that these such networks can represent efficiently, where efficiently I mean uh, with a polynomially large number of, uh, of parameters, Basically, any physical state, so gapped, gapless, or anything you can think of. So the important is just the Hamiltonian is local. And uh, so these theorems in particular show that any quantum state exactly of n qubits is generated by a quantum strict of deep t that can be represented exactly by a sparse deep Boltzmann machine with order n times t neurons. So if you have a gapless system, this t typically grows like the, system, the, the number of spins, but otherwise it's a constant depth circuit if uh, you have a gapped system. Now, uh, let me just uh, um, recap what, what I've shown you uh, today. So I've shown you that uh, we've introduced a new class of many body states, which is based on uh, uh, artificial uh, neural networks. With those things, you can do uh, several, uh, uh, several applications already. For example, you can find the ground state. Uh, you can uh, do quantum state tomography. There's also an application that we are doing that I didn't discuss, which, which namely you can try to describe uh, quantum circuits. So you can try to approximate classically quantum circuits. Uh, and then I've shown you that there is a lot of also work in the context of quantum information, but there's a lot more to be done. So there's also my call to the community. Uh, for example, trying to understand why and uh, how, what are the limitations of those states. Uh, but already we know that uh, some universal states based on uh, uh, Boltzmann machines exist. We know the connection with tensor networks, but this should be improved. 
uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the, the other things that we'd like to do are, for example, extending those things to fermions, even though this is uh, almost completed now, by now. Uh, and uh, also using deep networks, which is one very important methodological step to be done, and uh, taking also advantage of this theorem that I described in the, in the last part of my, of my talk. So thank you.